Okay. Hello, my name is Susan Richardson. I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Relations at Boston University. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Women, Work, and Self-Worth. We are fortunate to have two outstanding alumni featured in this program. Before we begin, I just wanna remind you if you have questions to please use the Q&A function uh, to submit them. Facilitating the conversation it, to with Claire Wasserman tonight is Allison Davis. Allison was the executive director of Arts Horizon and spent much of her career in television news working at NBC, MSNBC, and CBS. She's an award-winning journalist. She headed up a team of reporters who produced some of the very first original journalism on the internet. She is one of the founders of the National Association of Black Journalists and has served as the communications director for the Jackie Robinson Foundation and the Riverside Church in the city of New York. She has been recognized by History Makers, the nation's largest African American video oral history collection housed at the Library of Congress. Most important, she is a proud graduate of Boston University College of Communications. She received the BU Distinguished Alumni Award in 2009, and she's also an inaugural member of, of BU's Black Alumni Leadership Council. Allison, I turn it over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Susan. And I would be remiss if I didn't also mentioned that I am a proud graduate of CGS as well, the College of General Studies, which I know as CBS. Thank you so much. Um, what a pleasure, what a pleasure to be here. And, and I am so delighted and excited to introduce you all to Claire Wasserman. Claire is an educator, an author, and founder of Ladies Get Paid. And that's a global community that champions the professional and financial advancement of women. She's also the producer and host of John Hancock's podcast, Friends Who Talk About Money. I have none of those friends, by the way, Claire. Uh, Claire has traveled the country teaching thousands of women how to negotiate millions of dollars in raises, how to start businesses, and how to advocate for themselves in the workplace. You know, Claire was named one of the of one of Entrepreneurs Magazine's uh, 100 Most Powerful Women, and she is a highly sought after expert for Fortune 500 companies working to improve diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging within their organizations. And she's spoken at places such as Facebook, Harvard, and the United Nations Foundation, as well as partnerships with Nike, Indeed, and the city of Los Angeles. And Great news here, and you've heard it first. Her book, Ladies Get Paid, is currently available for pre-order, and hopefully we can give you that information a little later. So welcome, 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 Claire. Um, you know, I, you, in reading, you know, all that you have done and knowing that you graduated in 2009 um, from CAS, um, you know, no matter what decade you, you, you attended at Boston University, we're all sort of expected to make a difference in this world. And you have. Um, how did you get involved in the issue of pay equity for women and empowering women to, to, to seek pay equity? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And second of all, I'm so mortified that I put Harvard in my bio and not be you. Well, actually, no, because I'd never spoken at BU except until now. So <laughs> um, it just startled me when you said that. Uh, how did this all begin? Um, I, whenever I get asked that question, it's always like, how much time do you have? Um, I have to admit something. I never really considered myself a feminist up until about 2014, 2015. I think I had no idea what it really was. I had a complete misconception of it not particularly interested in women's issues. You know, I, I think I was, uh, well, you all know how old I am because I graduated in 2009. I think, you know, I just assumed my mother's generation, you know, they had sort of fixed the issue, the problem. And, you know, she was the third class of women in her college. It wasn't until I had a really sexist experience that kind of startled me out of my privilege, really. It's a privilege to not feel discriminated against. And just super quickly, the, the experience I was at an advertising festival, um, this guy comes up to me at, a, at an event and he, you know, older, nice, sticks out his hand, smiles, and he asks me, hi, whose wife are you? 
And I am so grateful to this man because it was just so startling and ridiculous. It made me see for the entire week that I was at this festival, all of these experiences where I quite frankly, wasn't really being taken seriously. And it showed me this was something my entire career, I had constantly had to navigate power dynamics between genders. And when you need somebody's business, which I did, right? I was looking for clients. This was at another company I worked for. If somebody does something that makes you uncomfortable, not only do you feel uncomfortable, you can sometimes feel like you can't say anything. Uh, and, and that, you know, in a sort of macro intense way, did that happen to me during that week? Long story short, after the whole festival, you know, I just started to write. I wrote about, yes, what happened, you know, but really more interestingly for me, it was me trying to process what happened and the times in which somebody, you know, said I was good looking or something. I internalized it. I thought, well, I must be too friendly or maybe my skirt's too short, right? I started to judge myself. And of course we realized that so many women, we do this, right? Something happens to us that doesn't feel good, but we first wonder what, what role did I play? And I, I thought about publishing my essay. Um, and, and then I felt, you know, I might be uh, in trouble at work, you know, that they might see this as pointing fingers or like man hating, which this absolutely wasn't. It was just me trying to understand the power gender dynamics. Um, and instead I just shared the essay with some friends who wrote me back and said, this is something that I have also experienced. Do you mind if I share it with some of my friends? And I said, yes. And then those friends wrote me back with their experiences. And basically this, this essay I wrote sort of went viral in our inboxes. Um, and this was before, you know, Me Too was a hashtag, okay? So this was like 2014. I started to research things like, what is feminism? I mean, I sort of laugh now uh, because I think I typed in women work and self-worth or, you know, whatever the title of this was. I mean, I really was starting from, from zero. And I read about statistics like the wage gap, you know, and it's not just the 78 cents to the dollar that we all think it is. It is as an aggregate, but if you start to break it down by race, uh, where you live, if you are married or not, right? I'm discovering things like the fact that Hispanic women are making 55 cents to the dollar. And that was actually the statistic that just jolted me out of my, I don't want to say complacency because I really wasn't quite aware that this was an issue in the first place, but it lit a fire. The issue is when you read about these statistics, it's systemic, it's overwhelming. So of course the question is, you know, as an individual, you know, what can you possibly do to combat something that is that big? So let's let's talk a little bit about this because, you know, we've received a lot of questions beforehand and almost, well, many of them were kind of male bashing. I'm not going to lie about that. So I want to read one question because I think it sort of lends itself to what you're just talking about. Um, so how does a woman stand in a male dominated to toxic environment where company politics is the norm? I mean, what kind of advice can you give for women who are experiencing that? Yeah, I mean, the word that stood out to me is the word toxic. You need to leave, but I'm going to say this. Every single one of us, you have to have a safety net. If you haven't realized that with everything that's going on, you definitely, you know, I think you're understanding it now. If you do not have the savings, you cannot walk away, right? The strongest negotiators are the people who are able and willing to walk away. So you need money. That aside, I think you have to determine, is this a toxic environment in which I can end up doing well in? I can change, right? If you feel like the answer is no to those two things, I want you to start looking for work elsewhere, right? Because there's only so much you can do. So is this a matter of, are you gonna survive or can you be in an environment that you thrive in? So I would say first, and again, this is advice for anybody, regardless of toxicity, toxicity or office politics, you need to have allies. Uh, in the workplace. You need to build relationships. You need to do that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, don't just wait until I was going to say the company happy hour, but you know, hopefully your company's not having one right now. So this is identifying who at, at the office, whether you work with them or they're higher up and I encourage you to sort of shoot your shot. You literally have nothing to lose. If you email somebody uh, in a position of power and you say, there's something on your resume I found interesting on LinkedIn, you pivoted or you spoke at this conference, use that as a way to get the conversation started. Because whatever you wanna do at your company, whether it's advocate for a promotion or change a policy or have a serious conversation about the office culture, you can't go at it alone, right? I mean, you could, but you're gonna feel alone, right? And it's not gonna be as, uh, you're not gonna get a yes in the way that you want if you're able to show that you're not the only person who is 
you know, who wants to make change. So and just you're making us an it. assumption here though, Claire, and that assumption is, is that our male bosses are mature enough. And that was one of the questions. Do you really believe that our male bosses are mature enough to understand the message that we are sharing with them? Uh, I think you have to, uh, I mean, I, this is one of those questions that until I know the specifics of the situation, I mean, you know best what your relationship is. Again, you have to decide, is this worth it? Is this worth it? Are they ever going to change? And by the way, you can always blame me. You can always say, I read ladies get paid. Um, I read about the statistics. And so it's not necessarily about blaming anybody. It's about your general concern and interest about making sure there's inclusivity in the workplace, right? So make it a larger conversation about you wanting the company to do better and not just about, you know, you are wrong, right? Because they're going to just shut down. So there's a little bit of diplomacy that needs to happen here, I think. So I think, you know, let's, let's sort of, um, talk a little bit about um, pay, because yeah. I think that's what a lot of folks are, are interested in. I mean, pay and empowerment, but let's talk about pay. So I'm working in a situation, I'm working my, you know, behind off. I feel like I'm doing a great job, but I don't feel like I'm being compensated for what I'm worth. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first is, I don't feel like I'm being compensated. You need to know if you're not being compensated appropriately. Uh, so that's where you have to do market research. Um, what is so fantastic is that you are here today, which means you are tapped into the alumni network. I don't know if BU surveys people about salaries, totally fine if they don't. But getting in touch with the organizers and asking, is there a way that we can maybe dialogue with each other about our salaries? talking to real people. I mean, I could go into a whole thing about how do you talk to your friends about money, right? Because I, I, I host this podcast. Uh, so as long as you've done your market research, being aware that there is a range, right? So you're not going to find this like one perfect number that shows you this is what I have to ask for. Your case that you're going to make is why the top of the range is commensurate with the excellent work that you've been doing. So it's about numbers and it's about the impact that you've had at the company, okay? Go to my website, clairewasserman.com. I have a, a free video for you to check out that I did with Indeed, because again, it's a longer story, but we want to remove how we feel about it and really make this about math and then evidence that backs up why you ultimately deserve to get paid top dollar, though I would not use the word I deserve because um, this is business. Uh, and it's showing that, you know, an investment in you is an investment in them because it's expensive if they lose you. So do be aware you, you actually have more leverage than you may, um, you may even think that you do. So, you know, um, you, you're there and, and I, I'm wondering if, if there's, I don't wanna do any sort of um, scene with you, but I think people need to practice, you know, what they say to their bosses once they realize that they're not being compensated at the same rate as their male counterpart. I mean, you can go in and, and and, and say, hey, you know, um, I believe that I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm helping the business and I deserve to be compensated for that help. But I'm, I'm just curious, is, is there a script? Yes, absolutely. And by the way, um, information is power. So you can absolutely start this conversation with asking them, how do you determine compensation here? You know, urge them to be transparent with you because you want to understand your place in the workplace, right? You wanna be a leader. So again, this, this can all be contextualized with, I wanna do a great job here. And part of that is having a better understanding of how you, you know, what the promotional cycle is. And so again, don't feel like you have to go in guns blazing and ask for the raise. You can start the conversation, you know, stepping back a little bit. So that's one thing. Second, the conversation is, I did my research. I did my research. I'd love to know, is this the research that you're benchmarking, you know, your compensation on? Again, how do you determine this? Um, and then know that whatever they say, and by the way, you're going to want to have a couple of numbers in your back pocket, because if you go in there with one idea of what you want, you might not get it. So what's the counter? What's that second number you're going to bring up? And there's that, that range. Remember when you're doing your research, you're going to find what's called a pay band, right? So you're going to ask for the top, assuming they counter with something lower, you're going to ask for the middle, okay? Um, Always bring it back to what you've done. I mean, have a couple of accomplishments in your back pocket, really tying it to the impact, quantified, qualified. If somebody said you did a good job, you got some positive feedback, bring that up. I've had somebody who did a PowerPoint presentation. I mean, really come prepared with what you want because if you leave it too open-ended for them to kind of run the script and you just are constantly playing defense, I mean, you should really be speaking for a lot of the time after you've gotten information from them. They lowball you and you say, that's a great starting point. Here's what I was thinking. 
What can we do together to get closer to that? See what I said there? We, right? This is a conversation. You're both on the same team. You, you work there. They want you to work there, right? Just so you know, other thing that I would mention is um, full compensation. So knowing that, yes, there is a salary, you may not get it. So what are other things that you can ask for besides money, right? And that's what's called full compensation. So if ultimately they say, no, no, we can't do it. You go, okay, I understand. Now I'd like to discuss full compensation. And those are things like flexibility, career development, et cetera. You have to get something from them, just one thing. Um, and by the way, if it's uh, accelerated promotion schedule, right? In three or six months, they're gonna do another review, get it on the calendar and check in with them beforehand. So again, you're not, you know, you're not waiting until it's time to articulate your accomplishments. You're kind of doing it all along the way. So, you know, you know we have a question, which is excellent because I've worked for women and I've worked for men. Well, what if your boss is female and you know that she isn't compensating you at your worth? What do you Can do? Can you ask why? Can you ask why? Uh, people always get nervous about asking why. I don't know if it's because they're afraid of what they might hear back or, you know, it seems accusatory. Again, contextualize it with you're concerned about the wage gap. You want to learn more. You can always say, you know, my understanding is that we pay fairly here. So I'd love to hear from you. She may be well underpaid. We don't know what her, you know, what's going on on her end. Um, so just start it. And you can always ask, what would you do if you were in my position? Hmm. <laughs> Turn it around on them. Very good, very good. Sneaky, sneaky. Uh, I love that. Um, can you offer some advice for somebody who's negotiating a new job, not some not some place where they've been for a while, but they actually are 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 moving into a new position? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, and this is for anybody who's applying for jobs. So, well before the negotiation, um, really know, like, look at the job description everything you've learned about the company, right? Company values, et cetera, things you can find online, people you've talked to, use their language, use that language and then tie it to how you exemplify it. So it's, you know, you know that the accomplishments you're gonna talk about is related to, to what they've even already said that they're looking for, okay? So that's one way you can kind of filter uh, what you talk about. Again, market research, market research. And I'm gonna tell you something that's, uh, I don't know if it's controversial, but other uh, agents have different ideas here um, or, or career coaches, excuse me. Um, some people will tell you never be the first one to say the number that you want, right? Because maybe you'll lowball yourself. I think that's the, the thinking behind it. Um, then you play this awkward game of chicken. No, you tell me how much you're going to pay. No, you tell. Yeah. The reason I also don't like that waiting for them to tell us is they may lowball you and you will be demoralized. You'll be thrown off. You'll think, oh, maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. Say what you want because it's the market research that you did. Quickly back it up with your accomplishments and then say, is this something you're able to do? So you're opening the door to a conversation. So please do not be afraid to be the first one. Just have backups knowing that you might not get it. So I'm reading this and this is a little bit of a long one. It's from Sarah. And she writes, as a 2008 alum, I started a new job last year at a local large pharma and they provided the range up front. The minimum seemed so high and crazy to me that I chose it because I wanted to negotiate on work from home childcare flexibility. Yeah. These, uh, there, th these are two women issues that she sees, women shooting lower because of being the main caregiver and feeling guilty for getting paid so much. How do you handle those feelings? And are they justified? Okay, first thing, anytime that you have self-doubt, <laughs> ask yourself, and. I might get some people not liking what I'm going to say, but I find it funny. Ask yourself, what would a mediocre white man do? Okay. Lowest common denominator. Would he ever think that? Would he ever do that? If the answer makes you laugh, right? If you laugh and if you think, yeah, you're right. He probably wouldn't have done that. I think you kind of have your answer there. That being said, you are socialized to want to be accommodating, right? We can go into lots of conversation around the messages girls receive. So you are not alone. Um, Shoot your shot, say, pick the high number, and then talk about full compensation. People are, if you don't do that, you're subsidizing other people at the company doing that. Let them tell you no. Do not be the person that you tell yourself no. Why don't you deserve to have it all? Why don't you deserve, and by the way, if they say, well, listen, if you're gonna be working from home more days, right, then how about we do this? A little bit lower of a salary. That's for them to say. That is not for you to say, okay? So I think, you know, by the way, it's interesting. I've read different research, some that says that women get, you know, 
part of a reason that we might get less is because we either don't negotiate or we negotiate lo lower. I've also read research that says that we do negotiate. We just aren't told yes. So if we already know that that might be happening, the fact that we would say no to ourselves, I mean, who's missing out? It's not just you. Your family is missing out. Generational wealth is missing out. So if you do find this tough to, to sort of advocate for yourself, then maybe imagine that you're advocating for you know somebody else. Uh, I find that that can actually be quite helpful. Now, you touched on this before, and of course, this is very personal to me, um, uh, but somebody asks, um, as a Black woman, uh, I hope you'll also look at the issue through a racial lens. And of course, we know that according to the U.S. Census, on average, Black women are paid 63% of what non-Hispanic white men were paid in 2019. And so... Um, and this is where I, what I found to be astounding. That means that it takes a typical black woman 19 months to be paid what the average white man takes home in 12 months. And I also think that, you know, uh, it's probably not fair to say, but I think that um, there are some stereotypes that uh, our white bosses have about black women, which hinders us from having the kind of relationship that white women may have. Yeah. So I, the, I guess my question is, is that, you know, how, is there any advice that you might have other than for black women to act white in that kind of situation? I mean, any, any, any help that you might be able to give black women who come in with um, uh, different issues than, than, than white women? Yeah, I, this is so important. Um, I, uh, first of all, any statistics that's bad for women, let me tell you, it's so much worse for women of color. And really, if you dig into the statistics, I mean, the wage gap for women over a lifetime, it says that we're losing half a million dollars. Women of color, a million dollars. I mean, I'm not talking about a little bit worse. We're talking, it's really bad. I think first step, hey, white people, men, we need to be better allies. We, and it's not just about, let's be nice to each other. It's about telling people's managers, I thought that Allison did a great job loved her presentation, right? You have to vocally advocate for each other. So that's one thing, okay? So we're gonna put that aside because it should not be on the underpaid and overexhausted to have to keep advocating for ourselves. So I actually think most of the work, if not 99.999% of the work needs to be the other people. That being said, first I would say, be aware of the projects that you're being given. Uh, research shows that women, but particularly black women are getting less uh, what's called glamor projects or high visibility projects, right? We're given work that might be more sort of admin support based. The issue with that is you're not, uh, you're not gonna get the exposure to senior management that you might need to be, or you're not gonna have the accolades on your resume that you need for your next job or promotion, okay? So I would say first, really go for the projects that will look great on your resume that you wanna do. And if you're not being given them, you gotta go ask for it. So I'd say that's first. Um, second, you can always talk about how you know, you're seeing, seeing a lot of support, a lot of movement on how diversity, you know, is good for the bottom line, which is true. 15% added to the bottom line when you have a diverse team. You can Google all of this, all these statistics about how, you know, supporting women of color in the workplace will help the business. This is not about just helping women or women of color. Go and make that case. Say, what are we doing about that? I mean, here's the great thing. I've been advocating for this, you know, for four years now about how we need to go in and push for better paid family leave policies or, you know, employee resource groups that help women of color. Now the companies are expecting you, right? We're holding them to task. We're holding them accountable. So again, it's not just about your own advocacy, but it's putting the burden on them, the onus on them to say, how are you supporting us in tangible ways, right? Because again, there's only so much you can do. There's only so much pushing you can do. And by the way, you made a sort of funny comment about like, besides acting white, what can you do? I, I think we all need to be very careful. Again, women of color and women in general. Um, if we act like somebody we are not, we're never gonna feel good by the way, cause we're gonna be contorting ourselves and that's exhausting. Um, you get penalized for it. There's this thing, and I'm sure you know what this is, uh, the double bind, okay? So when women act outside of how we expect a woman to act, we penalize her, meaning you're assertive, you might be perceived as aggressive, right? Black women already perceived as aggressive just by the fact of their race alone. So now they have to work even harder to kind of soften how they present, right? 
there is a, it's basically a tightrope and there's no one answer to this other than being aware and finding allies who can friggin' support you, which also means gaming things out saying, I'm in this scenario. Can you, can we do a script here together? What would you do? Um, so kind of take scenario by scenario of the things that you want to change in your life and in, you know, your, your job. But again, it's really about making sure that the company is doing better by you. And that also starts with recruitment. You know, talk about BU. Are these companies recruiting people to bring in for interviewing in diverse places and making sure that people feel welcomed? So there's a lot of different benchmarks. And I, and I talk about them in the book because, yes, we're all about how do we empower ourselves, but we're operating in a system. So we need to make sure that the system is, you know, is changing, too. And I'm not going to talk about what Black women and Black men have to code switch. Yes. And that's it. And, and, and that is a whole other different subject. Um, but we do have an interesting um, question here. Um, uh, Catherine Schuller says, I work in a company that is pretty flat in titles. So you got the worker bees and the VPs and not much in between. So promotions are hard to come by. However, uh, she says, I have evolved my original position to be more than what it was originally. So I am working beyond my job description. So how do you negotiate for a higher salary when my position is locked into a salary range and there is no room for promotion? Excellent question. And it is a question I, uh, it's interesting. People don't, they haven't articulated it as well as you have, but that's a question I get asked a lot. Uh, and also my co-founder, uh, I started this company and then she joined and it was largely because she was exactly in your position. So there is also a question mark of, is this a company where you can feasibly grow? And sometimes there's not. Um, first of all, looking at your original job description, literally go find it, write up a new job description of what you've actually done there. Focus on the scope change. Maybe you've taken on the jobs of multiple people. You've done things way outside of what you were asked to do, et cetera. Find, make your case based on those changes. Give them a proposal of here's what I'd like to be paid. Do you want a new title, a different title? People are able to carve out different things for themselves just because something has always been the way that it's been. If they want to keep you and you've made a compelling case, they will make sure that it happens. But if you just go to them and say, can I have a raise, right? Not good enough. You may need to really come in and say, here's why, here's what I suggest. I understand that it's outside of what you normally do, but I am that confident in what I've been able to, to prove and provide, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I would look at this almost as like, like you're carving out a new role for yourself, um, especially because it, you know, it sounds like you really evolved it so much. So perhaps you are, you cannot be fit into the current structure and it's worth it for them to think about something new for you. But again, if you're really stuck there, you're stuck there. By the way, next company that you look for, uh, this was advice that was given to me by the CEO of Vimeo, 37, woman of color, CEO. Okay, so this is she's a huge deal. Um, and she said every job that she's considering, she goes on LinkedIn and she does what she calls power mapping. She sees how long it takes for people there to get promotions, right? Mm -hmm. How long are they at those companies, right? Because it's a bad sign if people are jumping ship. Sometimes you can tell how sort of regimented these structures are just by looking at it online. So I would say if it's if you're feeling like you're just getting locked in here and you're not going to be able to move where you want to go, uh, make sure that you're doing due diligence um, for the next company so you don't find yourself in this position again. How important is it to find a mentor and particularly a female mentor? Uh, okay, so I'm actually going to broaden this out a little bit. I want you to think about uh, sponsors, coaches, and mentors because they're... There's not one person that's going to be everything for you. Um, and they shouldn't be because when you have a diversity of folks who are supporting you, then you have a diversity of opportunities. So maybe take a little bit pressure off of yourself to like find the one, okay? A mentor to me is somebody who provides general wisdom, life wisdom, career wisdom. They don't have to be in your field. They don't have to work at your company. In fact, it's probably better if they don't, right? They give you wisdom. Sponsor, and this is who you should really be focusing on finding, not so much mentor, sponsor. This is a person of influence who can advocate on your behalf. This is a person who has access to rooms that you maybe don't have access to. Because a mentor can only sort of give you general advice, which can be helpful. But I think what we really need is somebody up top to pull us up there. Um, other thing I was going to say is for coaches, that's more people who can help you with skills. 
So in terms of them being female or not, I mean, you know, we're all usually more comfortable with somebody who reminds us of ourselves. This is largely why I think men, you know, tend to be pulled up faster. It's, yeah, of course, there's sexism and all those things, but it's also because the people in power who are men want to help people who remind them of themselves. So there's also partly that. Go with who you feel comfortable for. Just make sure that they have connections, you know, that they have a large network um, or have influence because otherwise then they're really sort of just your friend, um, which is fine too. It's nice to have friends. Uh, so I think it's all really about like who's in your world and who do you feel most comfortable with. So how, how important is it for women to share insight on salaries with one another? I think you know the answer. Very important. Every, it's everything. There's the only way that you can make more is if you talk about it. There's literally no other way. Um, we all, here's the thing. It's a taboo subject, but every single person needs to figure out their salary. Like we all have to negotiate at some time. So if you're the first person to bring this up, you're actually doing everybody else a favor, right? You're like, you're the one normalizing this stuff. Um, again, blame it on me, blame it on the wage gap, right? You don't have to say how much do you make? You can say, what's a ballpark? Or if you're trying to figure out your own salary and you go to somebody in your field, you can say, I did some research. Here's what I found. Is it more or less what you make? Right. And then always I, you know, when you're trying to figure out your salary, I'm here to help you. Uh, it's huge. It's everything. Um, guys, please join ladies get paid, ladies get And um, we use Slack. It's free. And there's a salary negotiation channel. There's a money channel over 40,000 women all over the world. They're sharing it. So if you don't feel comfortable to sort of doing this, you know, go online and, and at least, you know, tap into those forms where that behavior, you know, is, is again, normalized, like I said. You know, unlike um, when I was looking for jobs, um, uh, there's so many startups, so many different opportunities and companies that have not been around for, you know, more than, uh, you know, two days. Um, so, you know, how do we know what we really should be getting uh, paid, mm -hmm. especially if we are uh, looking at a startup company? Yeah, that's tough. I mean, I think, I mean, this, my answer to this is really something I suggest for everybody, regardless of if you're at a startup, really understand holistically, what do you want out of this opportunity in your life? Chances are you're not going to get paid that much at a startup. Okay. So what else are they providing you? And the great thing about startups, because I worked for one before I started my own, um, I wanted a ground, you know, I wanted to be ground level. I wanted to see exactly how you build a business from hiring to firing, et cetera. So knowing if that is really important to you, be aware that you might want to, you know, you might end up having to sacrifice a little bit of money because you're getting this other thing. So just know that. I also got paid quite a bit at my startup. So it is possible. Can you ask them what's the sense of, you know, their revenue, their run rate? Get more information about them, about how they're doing. Um, if you have a choice between equity and money, right? More Because what they're going to do is they're going to say, we'll give you more equity and a smaller salary. If you have the choice, please take more of a salary and less equity. Because the chance that that company is going to end up either getting bought out or even getting, you know, staying in business so long to get, <laughs> long enough to get bought out, this might take you a really long time. So do know, you know, if you had to pick, go for the, the salary. Lots of other, there, you know, do your research, pay scale, uh, Indeed. Um, fairy God boss, that's female specific, ladies get paid. I mean, just do as much research as possible and please find other people who've worked at startups. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know anyone, go to somebody in your network who happens to know a lot of people and ask them, do they know anyone? Can you get connected? People are very, people are so generous with this stuff. You know, you, you just have to ask. And again, when you say, I'm here to support you whenever you have questions, um, you know, I'm, I can help answer them for you. Uh, so be, you know, but usually with startups, it's, there's a lot more uh, factors that you want to consider to see if the opportunity is worth it, even if you can't get paid as much. So what's your best advice for women trying to make a career change? You know, someone, you know, who decides, you know, look, I'm not going to do this anymore. I want to, you know, be an artist and, and, and work at this place because I find it more fulfilling. W what's your advice? It's so interesting. Uh, I'm writing an article right now about this. I have found during the pandemic, um, a lot more women are taking risks. Right? You'd think it'd be the opposite, right? We'd be like playing it safe. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the risks I find a lot of women in my community making, you know, taking is, is pivoting. You know, it's really reevaluating their values and, and, you know, making sure that their career choices are aligned with those values. Um, it's interesting. That question about, you know, do, first of all, does this person know what they want to do? 
right? So then it's like, all right, well, how do we get you to that place where you even know the direction you want to go in? The second part is I know what I want to do, but how do I break into that industry? Just kind of two parts. So maybe I'll just begin with the, you know, with that second part. Uh, you want to look at transferable skills, really. It's two things. It's transferable skills. So how can you show that you've demonstrated at least life skills, you know, that are applicable, whether it's being really detail oriented or creating something out of nothing, right? No resources, no time. You made magic, right? These things are, are transferable, I think, in any industry, any job. People want fast learners, hard workers, resilient workers, okay? So it's figuring out those transferable skills. This is the networking part. That's the second part. It's making sure you have a robust network where people can make introductions. Um, and, and it starts with, like I said, that person in your network who happens to know a lot of people, being specific about how they can help you. Do you happen to know someone who is in X, Y, and Z field? So you get referrals to connect with people and then tell them what you're looking for and then hopefully they can then connect you. Do it now. Don't wait until you need the job because this stuff is going to take, you know, a woman in the book I write about, uh, it took her a full year to change her, her industry, you know, from the time where she understood what she wanted to do and began networking all the way through getting the job. So do give yourself time, don't get discouraged, but your goal should be figuring out who you can talk to to get advice from and get referrals from. And then of course, telling the story about how, what you've done before and, and most importantly, who you are, you know, how does that set you up for success? And do be aware, perspective from an outsider, depending on what you wanna do as an artist, maybe not so much, but it's unique, it's unique, right? You're gonna look at things a little bit differently than the people who've maybe been there for a while. Uh, so, how, I mean, do you discourage people from, you know, looking um, for their next profession at the same time they're working at a present pr profession? In other words, if you know somebody wants to, you know, um, be, you know, the next Diana Ross and is singing at night, um, you know, at some small clubs. Uh, and as you can probably notice, this is my fantasy right now, <laughs> you know, because I cannot sing well, at all. It's very specific. I know, I know. I wanted to be a pip when I was in college because I knew I couldn't be Gladys Knight. <laughs> but, but I, you know, is there, is that just something that you would discourage, you know, um, to be working on your next life while you're in your present life trying to, that's the ultimate thing how to do it. That's the other, I mean, I have worked backwards from a very morbid place, which is if I were hit by a bus tomorrow, will I, you know, maybe not have lived the life I want to live because that's like a huge statement to make, but like, do I agree with the choices that I've made in my life so far? If you wait, to, here's the, kind of, first of all, you have to make sure you're doing a really good job at your office, okay, at your regular job, you're not dropping the balls. Do be aware that if you're doing uh, your own work on your work laptop, that's a no-no. Have I done that? Yes, I can't afford two laptops. So, you know, professionally, I'm supposed to tell you never do work on your company's laptop. Personally, that's how I did it. Um, just know uh, when it's gonna be time to quit. So basically have an understanding, what does success look like to you? Like, how do you measure success? And what are you gonna need to see in order to really pursue this? And is this something that's just gonna be on the side, right? It's a hobby, you enjoy doing it. Because if you're gonna, Sometimes when you try to monetize something, it takes, you know, the joy out of it. So do be honest with yourself if this is a professional path that you really do want to pursue, or if this is just adding to your life, to the richness of your life. But do have a sense of, of the benchmarks, because at some point you will have to make a decision. Um, I have never quit my job and then started something. I mean, that sounded too, like, I needed to see that it would work first for myself. Um, so I've had, you know, another failed startup. I shouldn't say another, because this has not failed. I have had a startup before that failed um, and I actually did work on it without being at a job and it didn't work out and I had to go get another job. Do I regret it? No. Um, but Can I ask um, uh, Claire, why did it fail? It's a very good question. I was too uh, immature um, and I don't mean that in a like, I mean that in the sense of I didn't feel confident to make decisions. I had a really hard time when there were crossroads, when I had to make decisions, right? Like, what is our business model? Is it gonna be this or that? I never, I would say, okay, let's go this direction. And then a week later I would say, no, 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 maybe we need to go the other direction because I had never done this before. And I didn't really have mentors. I didn't feel like I knew enough. So part of it was a confidence issue. And part of it was 
just no idea what I was doing. And, and that's when I realized I have to go work for somebody else in their small business so I can see how to do this. Um, so I, you know, and in a way it's, it's actually become ladies get paid. I mean, I, I practiced is kind of how I look at it. I was just practicing. <laughs> now we have a question, uh, not a question, well, a comment, um, which I think uh, is something that you can expound on um, from Mary Bowen. Um, she says, just wanted to chime in on this last question regarding growing beyond your original job description that we talked about. Always document your projects and new tasks you take on. She said, I did once have to submit a formal proposal documenting my increased workload, new areas of expertise in order to negotiate a raise. Keeping an up-to-date personal record of how one's job and responsibilities, workflows change is super helpful for these negotiation scenarios. Do you agree? Oh my God, a thousand percent. Absolutely track your accomplishments. Um, and by the way, when you have a win of some sort, that's a great time to go in and talk to your manager. It's just about your path for growth. I mean, you could, you know, bring up, hey, I'd love to get a raise, you know, but that is a fabulous time to capitalize on it. And by the way, when I say accomplishments, it could be anything from there was a challenge that you, you know, an obstacle. How did you work through it? So this doesn't need to be like some huge thing, right? So track the smaller stuff because over time, it's going to really reveal um, a pattern of your work. And then you can tell the story afterwards. But in the meantime, yeah, absolutely. I mean, put it in a spreadsheet. Take screenshots, by the way. Whenever you get some kind of positive email feedback, a client said good job or whatever it is, take a screenshot of it. I put it into a folder on my desktop. I call it a brag book because that's going to give you some sort of color commentary, you know, when you go in and, and you make your case. I, that's excellent, Mary. Good point. You know, um, uh, I once heard you talk about in, in one of the videos uh, uh, that I watched of you about the concept of fairness and how women have a tendency sometimes to take a look at what they do in the workplace, understand that they're not making the amount of money that they think they needed to make. And they say, you know, um, it's just not fair. And mm -hmm. they use that as an excuse to try and get some additional funds. But you said, you know, it's not about fairness. Can you um, sort of expound on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's about fairness for us, you know, between us. It's about business for them. It's always about the bottom line. And again, if you work there, they want you to work there, right? They, it's again, very expensive for them to lose you. So whenever, I mean, the only time I would use the word fair is maybe I, I know this is a place that compensates fairly, or I know this is a place that, you know, would want to compensate for it. That, that's when I would bring that word up. But it's always, you know, anything that you're asking for, whether it's a better paid family leave policy or workplace flexibility, et cetera, et cetera, you have to then be able to, to show, here's how this benefits you. How do you position this as a benefit to the company? And the good thing is, is you can research. There are so many things that we might want that actually is a benefit to the business. You just need to go and, you know, find that. And by the way, make friends with people in PR, marketing and sales, because they can help you spin how you present the things that you want. Excellent. Um, yeah. Very good, very good. I agree with that. Um, so how can we cope with managers asking for flexibility? This is another question that came up with our work to excuse additional responsibilities without additional compensation. And I know in my career, you know, people, you know, that, that oh, just be flexible mm -hmm. um, was sort of a rallying cry. Um, any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think about proactively, what are all the things they're going to tell you when you ask for this? What are all the reasons they're gonna say no, okay? Proactively address them. I think when you go in and you just say, here's what I want, first of all, that's scary, right? That's scary. So you go in and you make a case, assuming they're gonna say no, X, Y, and Z reasons. Nobody else does it. We don't do that here. We haven't done that here. Um, I'm concerned, uh, it's, you know, communication, is going to get lost. I'm making things up. But how do you show that you have already thought about this and you have a way to prove? Meaning maybe you're not going to get the flexibility you want now, but perhaps once a week you could take a day or every other week you could. So it's like also have a backup here. What's a, a smaller version of what you're asking for? So you can then prove to them, ah, you don't have to be so worried about this. And also again, there's research out there that shows that flexibility helps workers be more productive actually, and be more rejuvenated. 
happier, more likely to stay at the company. So do come with statistics also to back up what, uh, you know, the case that you want to make. You know, in the, in this age of the pandemic, there's so many folks who are working from home, working remotely, working without tremendous supervision. Um, you know, uh, what can we do um, as women to uh, prove our worth when we're not face to face with our bosses and our colleagues? Yeah, yeah. It's tough. I mean, it's actually kind of good for people who are introverts. <laughs> you know, it's like if you're somebody who already sort of feels uncomfortable swinging by somebody's desk and saying, hey, you want to grab a coffee? You know, you can do that by email, Slack. You know, because again, it does come down to those relationships, asking people, how are you doing? How are you? So instead of maybe looking at it as, as how do I demonstrate my worth? It's how do I continue to build and foster relationships here? Because think about when you talk to somebody else and you ask them a bunch of questions and they talk about themselves, they love you, right? Even though they just heard themselves speak. So you don't have to push it so much. Just make sure you're getting, you know, FaceTime, which, you know, which is this. Uh, and also in meetings, please, please, please speak up at least once. If you don't quite know what to say, piggyback off of what somebody else said. I thought, you know, I want to give a shout out to Allison. She had a great point. It made me think of this. Or so just find a way to just be seen. I think that's that's the point here. It's maybe less about worth, but more about visibility. Um, so maybe take some pressure off of yourself too. We have a question from Sabrina Knapp. She says, I work in a very hierarchical, hi hi hierarchical industry. I never know when it's appropriate to voice my opinion or request to be in certain, uh, involved in certain projects. How should one balance their place in the pecking order and advocating oneself as a woman in a male dominated industry? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, it's one that makes me wanna learn more <laughs> about the situation. This is, goes back to those relationships, right? Can you ask somebody else at the company? This is what, cause that's the thing, the, what's going on, the dynamics that are happening at that company are unique to that company. So any advice I give is gonna be a little bit too general. So can there be somebody else, um, even the person who had your job before, finding them on LinkedIn and saying, this is, you know, this is nothing bad here. I'm just curious how you might've uh, done it. Somebody in the book that I interviewed, that's exactly what she did and she was able to get insight. Um, cause you're dealing with people, right? So it's, there's certain personalities you're going to have to know how to communicate with them. So if somebody else can give you some insight, that's helpful. Um, I would, again, when you offer to help, people can say, all right, I mean, be aware of your boundaries that you need to set, you know, do your own work and that's great. But when you offer to somebody, I want to learn more. I want to learn more about what you do, or just, I want to sit in on this and I could take some notes or how can I support you? Right? So that's the first step of just getting included in some of these conversations. Um, and then you can also maybe find your own opportunities. I mean, every job that I have ever had, I have come up with some, basically I was an entrepreneur, which I have recently discovered there's a word called intrapreneur, where you almost act like a little business within another business, where you see there's a need you can fill, um, some kind of gap, make a proposal, say again, I'm excited about this business and I want to see it do well. I'd like to make this presentation you, because you may actually end up being able to carve out your own thing as opposed to jumping on board with what other people are doing. As long as you contextualize it with, hey, listen, you may have never done this before. I don't want to overstep my bounds. I mean, all the concerns that you mentioned in this question, you could tell them, but you also need to make the pitch for why you should be included or why they should say yes to you. But I, I would get insight from other people who've maybe worked um, for, these, for these people. How do you know who to trust? Yeah, that's hard. That's really hard. Um, oh, well, that starts again with building the relationships first. Uh, anybody who seems upstanding, you know, I wouldn't disclose too much. It's really speaking generalities too. Generally, this is something I'm, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. I mean, instead of just hearing from one person, if you can hear from a number of people, maybe in those sort of general, you know, sense, only you know, listen to your gut always, always listen to your gut and know that everything is a learning experience and that's where the savings come in because you might need to tap into them. That was depressing. Sorry. That was like <laughs> really dark answer. <laughs> no, no. I, you know, I know that in some cases, you know, uh, in my own career and certainly when I was a manager as well, that you'd have situations with, um, 
with competition in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so you might share something that just gives some fodder to the person who is interested in moving up as well. And uh, particularly if you're on the same level with someone. So I was just, uh, I was curious about that as well, you know, because you really in, um, it's, workplaces can be cutthroat. Yeah, I mean, again, this is where like, is there a different company that company culture that's better for you? My, my challenge, you know, my challenge to everybody is, is there a way to get the information you want without disclosing too much? You know, look at it like diplomacy also, and everything's a negotiation. That's the thing. You, you're trying to get something from somebody else um, and you may need to give a little bit, you know, share something of yourself, but holding your cards this is, you practice guys, like any situation that you are in, instead of just going for it, really game out. If I say this, what do I expect them to say back or do with this information? If that happens, what then? Again, there's in, in the book, I, I write about the story of this woman who's discovered she's being paid so much less than the men and not just her. Categorically, all the women are being paid less. And she's thinking, what do I do? She goes in and negotiates, gets a raise, but it's still nowhere close to, to anybody else. There's also other issues, sexism, discrimination, all of that. And she's thinking, do I need to sue them? And this is a true story. This is a true, every story in here is true. Uh, I'm not allowed to say who she is, but there's a New Yorker article about her out there. So I'll let you find that. Uh, she um, ends up going to allies, you know, but knowing that this is an extremely sensitive thing, she just says, in general, how would you approach a situation like this? Um, and they said to her, I wouldn't do anything. And these were men. They said, it's too, it's going to damage your relationship, like your reputation. And so then she had to make a decision. Um, was she going to go ahead and do this? You know, so those were allies that were not really allies to her ultimately. So I won't tell you the end of the story. So you read the book, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's tough. And, and, you know, I'm so tempted to tell you what happened, but you know, <laughs> I'm going to ask you, don't worry, I'm going to ask you a little something about the book as well, but we have a question here. What's the best advice um, you've gotten on how to manage being a working mom? Well, I'm not, so. Well, that, I uh, figured you weren't, but I don't, I don't know why she thought you were. I have were, a but, cat, so. I have a cat, baby. Um, <laughs> man, first of all, I, I can't even imagine. I cannot, just, you're the most important person in your life even though you might think it's your children. Listen, if you don't put the oxygen mask on yourself first, you can't help them. Um, so be protective of your energy and your space. Recognize that the things that you're doing as a mom can absolutely be woven in to the story you tell about why you're excellent at what you do. Obviously you'll need to, you know, I could work with somebody individually about, well, how do I talk about, you know, being part of the PTA? And because, you know, we want to tell a holistic story about you. So you, you know, there are things that you are learning and doing uh, in your home life that you can absolutely use when you're advocating for promotion because they show again how how excellent you are. Um, I think it's um, and let me tell you just a quick story about in the book. There was a woman who worked in a major company and noticed that when she came back from maternity leave that she was really marginalized uh, and lots of things happened to her. She saw it was happening to other mothers. She ended up getting a job elsewhere because again, to that point earlier of you have to decide if it's even worth it, if this company can change. At the next company, she decided front and center, she wanted to really sort of wear her parent badge. And they didn't have an employee resource group. They're dedicated to parents. So she made one and she created take your kids to work day. Uh, she ended up then doing a major family paid leave policy improvement and now works in a new company where that's what she does. She didn't go at it alone because again, exhausted, lots of other things going on, but she galvanized other people. So you don't have to feel like you're fighting this battle by yourself. You know, the company is making some changes to show that they support parents. And guess what? That company that she did that for, they ended up winning some award about how it was one of the best places to work for if you were a parent and their competitor company improved a lot of their, uh, their paid family leave policy as well. Uh, and she now has it on her resume. So I would say, you know, take care of yourself, uh, keep track of your accomplishments, even outside of the workplace, and then see if there's uh, something larger culturally that the company can do to support people like you. And, and oftentimes, I don't know if you found this in your research, but um, when I was at NBC News, um, there were very few women who were working mothers. Mm -hmm. And when Jane Pauley had twins, <laughs> the floodgates opened, everybody 
figured at that point it was okay because she was talent and she was, you know, very important to the news division, um, that it was okay to become others. And it helped the organization uh, uh, to, um, uh, they compensated for the fact that they had more working mothers than they ever thought. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, things got easier for us. Um, One thing I just wanted to mention sure. um, for moms, please, please, please make sure that you're being paid fairly. Uh, there's a thing called the motherhood penalty that is actually a huge factor in the wage gap. Yeah. Every child a woman has, apparently she gets paid 4% less. I say apparently because I want y'all to do your own research, but yeah. I've shown that every child a man has, his pay goes up by 6%. Again, wage gap, there's a couple of different factors that contribute to it, but the major one is mothers. Okay. So just all of us should be make sure that we're negotiating and getting paid what you know what we're worth but particularly if you're a mother uh you want to do that and you can mention the motherhood penalty say i know that that's not something that happens here but i've been doing some research again blame blame me blame ladies get paid uh because that that is you're doing when you advocate for yourself as a mother you're advocating for for everybody really you know, we've talked about the book, Ladies Get Paid, and that book will be, you can pre-order it now, and it, it you can uh, have it in your hot little hands in January. Yeah. Um, just uh, very briefly, if you can just, you know, tell us, you know, what we're going to read when we read. I mean, are we reading stories about individuals? Are we reading statistics? statistics? What, what, just yeah, what yeah. So about? super quickly, it's, uh, I, I tell the stories of nine real women. Each of them is facing a different professional challenge. Uh, and as I tell their story, I kind of stop along the way and I give advice. So I'm sort of career coaching them, but I'm really career coaching you. And, uh, you know, it's everything from overworking? How do you kind of draw the line between working hard and then overworking? Um, and then it's really specific. It's almost like a toolkit. End of the book, uh, there's an appendix and it's about how do we change the laws, right? So really the book begins with how do you make sure you're advocating for yourself? Towards the end of the book, it's how do you advocate for change at your company? And then the appendix is how do we make change for everybody? Um, so it's narrative, it's toolkit, ladiesgetpaid.com slash book. It's there. I know I'm biased. But it's really excellent, and it's also not just my mom who told. And, and I'm, and I'm absolutely sure, and I'm so sorry that we can't get it before Christmas because I would definitely purchase some for Christmas gifts because I think it's so needed now um, to Next get year. that kind of advice. Next year. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. There's still going to be the wage gap. Sorry to say, <laughs> still going to be relevant. <laughs> yep, yep. So. Susan. I want to thank you both. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, Claire. Great advice. Wonderful information. I know, uh, Claire, we spoke earlier, the book will be available everywhere. Uh, independent bookstores, uh, Amazon, Target, lots of good places. So uh, look for it when it comes out. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for joining us today, which happens to be Giving Tuesday. And your support to Boston University means more than ever. I'd like to invite you to join the over 800 donors who made a gift to BU today. We are using Giving Tuesday to focus on funds that support anti-racist, diverse, equitable, and an inclusive BU or any other fund of your choice. If you'd like to make a donation, please go to bu.edu slash alumni and it will give you the link. Again, thank you both, and thanks everyone for participating tonight. Be well. Thanks, Allison.